Hi, this is part six of the advanced training for becoming a Google Certified Educator Level 2. In this unit, we're going to take a look at designing interactive curricula. The focus is on pretty much every basic app that Google has. This entire unit felt somewhat like Google was trying to sell me on the idea that Google Apps are for interactive classrooms, which if you're working on your level two certification, you've already bought into Google as a great tool in the classroom. That said, a lot of the unit was trying to say, be more interesting, don't do as much direct instruction, direct lecturing, try and use the Google Apps for a positive purpose. Here they're talking about sharing slides with students rather than presenting them. By sharing out your file, you can include instructions, visual samples, tutorials, videos, images, and the kids can go through at their own pace. Kids that are absent can go through it at a later time. You can link a form within the slide deck to check for comprehension, have them record comments or reflections. You can quiz them even in the middle of your slide presentation. You can also have students create slide decks that demonstrate understanding or to create portfolios. They do make a great project. You can make in, uh, YouTube videos interactive by adding either annotations or cards. These are essentially those pop-ups that are not advertisements. You can add an annotation by clicking Add Annotation to add a speech bubble, a spotlight, a note, a title, or a label, and all of those except for titles can be links to something else, to another video, to another site, and you can have the kids click on that for more information for what in whatever whatever topic you're working in and have them research more about the video. Cards are teasers that combine a title, an image, and text for a different video or website that appear at a designated time. This is a little bit more complicated than the annotation. You can add one by clicking edit, then card, then add cards, then create whatever kind of card you want. They then go over some other kind of innovative interactions, including one of my favorites, which is the choose your own adventure form. When you actually do a form, if you add a multiple choice question, you can indicate that if a child selects a specific answer, you can go to page based on answer. So for example, you can have them decide whether they're going to go down the left street or the right street. And if they go down the left street, they're going to meet Frankenstein. And if they go down the right street, they're going to catch a Pokemon. You can also use that same for form function in a much more boring way to guide a student through a multi-step activity where student choice is featured such as if you select choice one, which is the slides project, you're going to go to this page with the instructions for the slides project. If you choose to do the, the website project, you're gonna click choice two, and you'll go to the page based on choice two that goes over those instructions, rather than the kids seeing a whole bunch of instructions for two projects and they're only gonna do one and they don't wanna get confused. Um, they also suggested using multiple apps in one lessons, lesson to keep the students engaged. The implication is that kids can handle doing slides, then sheets, then docs, no problem. And the differentiate and the and the and changing it up will make kids more into it. They also mention hyperdocs. This is another example where they're using a big word for no apparent reason. A hyperdocs replaces a traditional worksheet with an online worksheet featuring inquiry-based activities and hyperlinks, graphic organizers, and any media supporting the inquiry. That said, the actual doc where they describe hyperdocs says that you can take a document and you need to make sure what is this document allowing a child to do that they couldn't do before. Otherwise, all you have is a fancy worksheet. I think either way you have a fancy worksheet, but they call it a hyperdoc. Then they talk about finding other curricula, which is essentially a use the internet to find other curricula. You want to expand your professional learning network beyond in-person peers. You can do this through Google communities. You can do this through Twitter. There's a whole bunch of ways to connect. You can use Google search tricks, which I covered in the first part of this series. And also it seemed to indicate that we're going to go back to those tricks in unit eight. So I'm not sure what tricks they're going to cover in unit eight. I haven't gotten there yet, but I look forward to it. 
Um, you can use social bookmarking by sharing links. You can share links through a sheet. You can share links through a shared Google Keep note. You can share links through Pinterest. Um, you can share through social media. Anytime you do a social bookmarking, that means you're kind of bookmarking it for not just yourself, but also the community. You can use common sense skills when going through the internet. The same thing we tell the kids. Analyze the web address. Look at the, analyze the look, feel, and point of view of a website. Use the about page to find the source of the site's information. Double check any facts that you find. If your website is coming from a debatable source, it's probably not going to have the information you want, or at least not reliable information. If the website looks like a train wreck, it probably is a train wreck. Don't use it. Khan Academy, they mentioned, which is a great website. I've had my students use their PSAT and SAT vocabulary training course. It's free. There are ways um, for math teachers, I think, to keep an eye on the work that their students do in those subjects. It's harder for working on the PSAT, SAT right now. Or as of June, there were no administrator controls on distributing that information. And they also, Google mentions Guru, which is a quality source that allows teachers to search a collection of user created content for education. I've never used Guru. I'm going to look it up after this particular video, but I think they're just mentioning these two websites as a means of saying these are some of the websites that you could depend on as opposed to websites that are a little bit more faulty. That's it for this unit. See you in the next unit.